ado, let me introduce the speaker for today, Professor Robert Zimmer. He is the academic lead of Goldsmiths Worldwide at Goldsmiths University of London. He studied at MIT, Cambridge University, and Columbia University, where he received a PhD in mathematics in 1985. He also began his research career developing mathematical methods for hardware and software system security with applications to safety critical systems, including nuclear reactor protection systems. Not only that, he has also gone on to research such varied subjects as artificial intelligence and digital art theory and practice, as well as the financial mathematics and financial technologies that are the subject of this talk. So I think it will be very beneficial official for us to hear from him. So without further ado, let us welcome Professor Zimmer. Professor Zimmer, over to you. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm sort of waiting to see my face, but maybe I don't. Okay, so um, hello everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Robert Zimmer. Everybody calls me Zimmer actually, as it happens, but almost nobody calls me Professor Zimmer except for my mother. So it, it's, I just uh, want to just, say a little bit about the various hats I have that are involved in this. I, I have a, uh, I run this, I am the convener for the MSc program. So that's the main thing that, that brings me here. So I run the MSc program. I, I developed the MSc program. I'm mostly in charge with the MSc program. I'm very proud of the MSc program. And um, I, I, I hope that, that several of you become, become some of our students in future. Uh, but I also run the, all of the kind of online provision for Goldsmiths, which is one of the colleges at the University of London. So I'm, I'm interested in, in expanding what we do beyond what we already do, which is we run this master's program and the BSc in computer science, which is also available at, at SIM. And I think that maybe some of you have, are graduates or, or still studying that. And, um, I'd be interested to know about your, your experiences of that at some point if, if we get a chance. But what I'm going to talk about today is uh, part of the MSc in data science, particularly in the, the stream that is financial technology. Uh, and I teach two of the modules on that stream. And one of them is, um, okay, I'm hoping this works. One, one of them is, is about blockchains. And I, and I was very, very pleased that a couple of years ago, I was on my birthday, as it happens, I was in Singapore talking about blockchain programming, or, or actually an introduction to blockchain that, that uh, there in person. And I wish I could be there in person today to do this, but alas, not, not, not to be at the moment, but maybe for, the, for, the, for next year. So, that's one of the things. So, what, so the program includes that as one of the things that happens in the program. We learn about blockchain and in that module, we build uh, our own cryptocurrency called Zimcoin and everybody becomes a mining node, for, if, if those of you know what that means, on the blockchain for that module, for that uh, the cryptocurrency. So we, you will be, do mining and trading and stuff, and you write all the software and learn a lot by doing that. So that's a great module. And that's the module I did last year. The module I'm doing this year is about forecasting time series. So we're going to look at forecasting time series now. We're going to look at how we might use forecasts of time series to choose, uh, to choose uh, shares for a portfolio or something like that. And at the end, maybe I'll talk about other applications that actually work a bit better. Actually, choosing shares is a particularly hard one to do. So, okay, so that's me. I'm, I'm Professor Robert Zimmer. I'm lead of Goldsmiths Worldwide as a and convener of this program. Okay, so let's get to the uh, subject. Right. Okay, choosing shares. There's two real, there's a, there's a bifurcation in the way people evaluate shares. One is called fundamental analysis and the other is called technical analysis. And the fundamental analysis is when people look at shares and they say, well, this share represents a company and what, how, how solid do I think this company is? Is the company going to grow? Uh, does the company have a good senior management team? Uh, do they have a, a great idea for the future? 
Are they undervalued at the moment? That's a kind of cross between the two. And I think this sector will do well in the future. So it's stuff about the company and the sector. So, so here's a here's a picture of a, of, of somebody who might be a a, a fundamental investor looking at the building. This this is what what she's looking at. This is the, she's looking at the company. She's looking to see well, is this company a, a good company? Now that's not what I tend to do. I'm more like this guy on a good day. I don't want to show you a picture of me on a bad day. That's a picture of me on a good day. Um, I'm not looking at the company so much. I do some, especially sectors. But more than that, I'm looking at the what the, sh the share price as, as a, an object in itself. So I'm looking at the graphs of these share prices and trying to get some sense from those graphs of the share prices what's likely to happen next. And that's what this module is about. So technical analyses tend to be looking at patterns in the share price. Now, that can mean lots of different things in this, and it can be very complicated. One thing is, as in this picture, I can be saying, this is going up, great. Or I could say, this has gone down, and I have a sense that it's gone down as much as it's going to, and it's gonna go back up to where it was before. That's a good time to buy. And just more generally, this, this, you look at more subtle ways of looking at patterns of behavior and of graphs, not people, but of course the graphs represent people, but the pattern of behavior of the graphs to get a sense of what usually happens in this sort of, at this sort of time. So what's that got to do with data science? Where, how can data science and machine learning help this? And you learn a lot in this program that's related to this. So, for technical, what am I saying? I'm saying, well, I'm looking at patterns of graphs and I'm trying to get a sense of which patterns of graphs are useful, what are going to predict that things are going to go up. Or if I'm a short trader, we will go down. Now, there are lots of machine learning tools that are really useful for that. And in, in, the, in the program, you'll learn, there's a whole module about deep learning uh, there's a, you'll learn about recurrent neural networks and you'll learn about Kalman filters. Those are three very general ways of doing this sort of thing. And they all show up in the program one way or another. Okay. But there's less technical things that, 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 that you might want to do that would also use machine learning. There's something called sentiment analysis where you might look at, at for example, what people are saying on social media and say, People are saying this, this, this company is being talked about a lot on social media with positive comments. This may, this may well go up, especially if you look at, at meme stocks. That's some, that can be really, really useful to you. Or, or you can look at not, the, not just the, the stocks prices, but you can look at the data about the company itself. So that's kind of using these, these machine learning tools. You can use them on information you get that a fundamental trader or a fundamental trader or, or, or investor might use about the company itself. You can analyze the history of the, of the board members using all sorts of techniques for cluster analysis and all kinds of things that you'll learn about in this program. So you could, that's another way that, that, that data science can come into this. But what we're gonna be talking about today is more to do with what my module is. It's, it's, it's not, it's not this word here. It's somehow got an extra P in it, but it's bespoke. It's supposed to say bespoke, it's bespoke analysis. So these are techniques that are particularly made for looking at time series, for looking at what, for analyzing something that changes in time. And so stock prices is of course, one of the things that changes in time. So we're going to look at stock prices as they change in time. And let me take it as a series of changes and work out, develop techniques, particularly for that, that kind of domain. They're, slight, they're slightly different than the, than the ones we use. We will, in the module, we go back and we use deep learning recurrent neural networks and Kalman filters, but there's also very specific ones that are developed just for, for this, this kind of subject. This, a lot of these techniques are, 
are origin, originate in a subject called econometrics, which is really about the mathematics of economics. Um, so a lot of the writing on this is by econometricians. We do take a different view because of who we are. It's my, I use the same algorithms in, uh, uh, that they use, but I talk much more about the maths and much more about how to make the programming work. And if you did an econometrics course on time series, you do some of the same techniques, but you would just use library functions and you would not learn about the, how the algorithms really work. So that's what's different. So uh, I'm, I'm, one of the models for my, for my uh, program, this module comes from, from T.S. Eliot, with the phrase time future contained in time past. So the idea here is looking at the past will tell us, give us a key to what the future will be. That's the idea. And that's what we're exploring in this module, whether that's true or not. And it works better in some domains than others. So that means we think of, of the next stock price, not just as a function of time, but as a, a function of previous stock prices. We'll, we'll see that in a picture in a minute. Okay, so let's, let's, start, let's start looking at this. Okay, now, the module uses real data always. Every, all the data we use is real data, except when I'm teaching you a little technique, I might just make up some data to make it fit. But the way the module works is it's all real data. The way it, I've got, I think I've, I've got six to 10 real data uh, sets that I use to develop all these techniques Every student has his or her own data. They have, they, have, they have his or her own five or six um, data sets. And, they, and, and the students each go through all the techniques with all their data. They kind of make a table in the end and we, we kind of compare notes throughout the term. That's the way it works. So everybody will be looking at real data, but everybody will be looking at different real data and then we'll compare notes in, in webinars during the term. So where do we get real data? Well, one really good source of financial data is, is Yahoo Finance. I don't know how many of you have been to Yahoo Finance, but Yahoo Finance is, is Yahoo Finance and Google Finance are both very good sources of data. So Yahoo Finance is easy to import into Python now. So, uh, so this, this is just saying, I'm gonna import Y Finance, which is Yahoo Finance, in today, into my system, and I'm going to, just going to call it YF because I don't want to keep typing Y finance. Okay, and then I'm going to say, right, now here's a ticker symbol. Uh, some of you will recognize this, symbol, this ticker symbol, and even if you don't, you probably could guess what that ticker symbol is. That is the ticker symbol for Tesla. Okay, so this is this is the Tesla ticker symbol, and so this I've now. Okay, great, I've now it didn't complain. That's that's all I wanted there. I've now got in my system a lot of information about what the history and present of of um, of, of, of Tesla. So if I run this, it should. It will tell me, it shows me what kind of thing it's giving me. It's giving me lots of information, some, some more interesting than others. Here's the zip code of their main office, but there's all kinds of things here. You can see this, you can peruse this at your leisure. Uh, this is all open source, all open to anybody who wants it. Okay, now I don't want all of that information. What I want is share prices. So the way I'm gonna get share prices is I'm gonna take this ticker that I've just got, and I'm gonna ask for the history and what I've got here is for some reason, I've just got a month in 2018. I could do the last, I could do up to a minute ago. I don't have to be historical, but I just randomly took that time. And then when I do that, good, that, that will happen. Then I can see what it looks like. Okay, that's the information I've got now. This is all about the share prices. This is, doesn't tell me any more about the, I've, I've lost the information. This doesn't have the information, for example, about the zip code. So this is just, just has share prices, but it has more than I need. And we'll see, we'll, we'll see what we do about that at the moment, but let's draw a graph and see what happens. Okay, here's a graph of this data. 
Now, I've got lots of things here. As I'm not counting, it's about eight, I think. Um, but it looks like I've only got two, right? I've got this big purp this purple one, which is really interesting. And I've got this horizontal line. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is the purple line is the volume. So if you look back to here, the volume is in millions. I think that's, I think that's 21 million is the volume. And the opening price is 62. So the, everything else is dwarfed by the, by the volume. So we, we don't want the volume in the, to be there at all. Or we, if we did, we'd, we'd have to do some scaling. But what I'm going to do is get rid of it. In fact, what I'm going to do is get down to just, I'm going to get rid of all of these all of these columns except for the close one, which means the price at the close of the day. Okay. And now I've done that. And now if I plot that, so I've just made this thing, which is just the closing prices and plot that. So in that month, this is what the Tesla share price looked like. So it was quite up and down and it ended the month Probably slightly up, but hardly up from 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 where it, where it where it started. Not a great month for Tesla. Tesla has better better months than that. Okay, but what I'm going to do is be able to forecast what's going to happen here. Because boy, would we be rich if we could work out this is it when we want to sell, and we're going to wait a bit, and then we're going to buy again here, right? That's the that's the desired effect here. We want to sell here and buy here, right? And really, I mean, you're never gonna be able to tell you're at the top. So you really, it's probably gonna be something like, if you're lucky, you'll be able to tell you've started going down, let's sell. And if you hear you started going up, let's buy. But it's more sophisticated than that because you start going up lots of times that don't, you don't have to go any place. So it, it, we, it's quite sophisticated now. Here's, I'm just going to say, here's some very simple forecasting techniques. Now, we're not going to talk, we're not going to go in detail today, but they're just going to, these are the first ones you do in the program. Uh, the naive one says, tomorrow will be the same as today. So just, you just say, okay, uh, to, today, if, it, if the share price is 63 today, the share price will be 63 tomorrow. Um, that's, that turns out in share prices, that turns about to be a depressingly good way of, of of, it does depressing the good way of forecasting in the sense that it's hard to do better than that, um, even though that's really just a random thing. So uh, the a little bit more sophisticated than that is you take the average of the last few, and that's the second thing we do. And then we build up more complexity as we go. So I'm going to go actually do order regression, which is the one, the next one we do in the course. So we're not going to go. We're going to go through this in, in, without certainly the details of the programming, which you would do if you did the course. Okay. So the idea here is we're going to take seriously the dictum from T. S. Eliot that time futures contained in time past. So we're going to think of the what I'm forecasting as some some function of the times I've that I've already that have come already. So if I look at this picture here that we've already seen. This is a function of the price as a function of the date, right? This is just, this is a graph of a function against the time. We're gonna move a little bit beyond that and we're gonna say, okay, I want, to, I want to draw something different where I want to think about the future as a function of the past. Um, oh. I think I, 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 something went wrong with my with, with my import statements. I hope it doesn't get too much of a problem. But what what I think they're not going to stop and do it now. But um, the, what I was going to draw is a graph where we have as the x-axis uh, past the history, and as the y-axis the, the the present. So then we get a function that gives us. So this is the, in two dimensions. All I can do is the last. The, the present value as a function of the last value. Now it's not actually a function in, is that you might have more than one thing in the same 
X, but it just gives you a sense of how they relate to each other. And it looks quite like Y equals X as it happens, but then, but it gets more subtle as you go. Okay. This doesn't affect us more. Okay, um, right. And what we do with that data is we take, so we get, if, if this had worked, we would have got, and it worked earlier today, so I'm not sure what happened, but we would have, we would, we would get a graph with a lot of points in it, and we would draw the graph, the line that fits it best. And the line that fits it best, a line of best fit for those, for those, for those um, points. Actually, it's not quite that. It's the line of best fit that goes to the origin for those points. That's a technique called AR1, and we learn that. And we learn that as the by as a line of best fit. So we do that, we we do that in the in the module. So now, uh, so we then move on from that. That's just that AR one. That's the only one I can draw, but I actually couldn't draw it today as anyway. But is is just looking at each number, each function number as each as a function of the number that came before. What we really want is to look at a number, quite a, quite a few that have come before. And that's, we want a pattern of, of behavior that's not just what happened last time, but what happened the last five times, the last 10 times, or what have you. And that's called ARP. So if it's the same idea, you're gonna get a best fit surface uh, the, in the higher dimension, but that mid, uh, around some points, it's the same, it's same Uh, what I've now done is I've taken that idea and I've done AR3, as it happens, and I'll talk about why that in a minute, with some Tesla shares. And, all right, good, that worked. So the, way, so the way I did this is I said, I've used AR3 and I just said, okay, what I'm going to do is this is a quite this, this particular strategy I'm going to use is, is pretty conservative. I don't buy the, that often. I buy whenever the predicted value using this technique is over 4%. And I sell whenever, it's, whenever the predicted is not over 4%. So I sell, I sell quite a lot. So I don't hold on very much. This is a lot, a lot of code. You certainly don't want to see this now. And actually, when I do this in, in the lectures, it's not all this code all at once. I can tell you that much. So the code we go through much more, much more careful, much more slowly and carefully than that. But these are the results of that. Okay. This is this is the share price of Tesla. Uh, this is actually more recent. This is this is 2021 to 2022, sometime. It's more time and more recent than the one I showed you above. Um, and what look at this? This is this graph here is a graph of uh, the blue is the price. Okay, the yellow is when I'm not holding anything. The green is when I'm holding and it goes up. So this is a very good. You can see where this is going up. Uh, well, this this is what you're looking for, right? When you get this great trend upwards, you see I'm holding that. I'm holding all that there. And that's what's really good. And um, that, and then this yellow is not no, and the red is what I'm holding, but it's going down. So there's more green than red. That's good. As I say, this is the share price itself. So look at this in this period. Here's the beginning. Here's the end. They're pretty much the same. So this is not the. If I had bought here and just held it, I'd have the same amount of money at the end as I had at the beginning. This is using the, the technique I used before, or that I described before, the simulation uh, of, of, of when 4%, when it says it's going to go up 4% to use it, or 0.4%. This is how much money I've got in my account. So even though Tesla has pretty much stayed, it hasn't stayed the same, but it ends up the same as where I started, my account number, my account holdings have now gone from around 10,000 to around 12 and a half thousand. So it's gone up by, by 25%. So that's pretty good. And just to say a little bit about where that three comes from. Oh no, I can't do that. I have the same problem I've got with the other one. But I'll say that without showing, showing you a picture. 
the 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 pro the the way you try to work out a, which p you use for an ARP is you do what's called a correlation analysis. So you try to find you, you use some training data to which lag. So that's a lag is like minus one, minus two, minus three. Which ones seem to have an effect on the price? And you actually use something that's called a partial order correlation function, which um, I won't, it's too technical to go through now, but we would learn that in the module. We would learn how to choose that three and how to do this. And with any luck, you will we'll, we'll have more money at the end than we had at the beginning. Okay, um, I'm going to stop screen sharing now and then ask for questions. Yes, there are actually some questions while you are sharing about the subject. Right. Um, there's Noel who actually asked where can we actually get good data, especially the end of day data? Like where do you actually get those resources? The da that data is just freely available from Yahoo Finance. So the, you just, it, so I, and I use Yahoo Finance because it's quite easy to get into Python. So uh, anybody can get that data. Yahoo, Yahoo has that data. Google has that data. Uh, I'm sure other people have that data if I, if I think about it. So that, that data, all that data is publicly available. Uh, we use different data as well, which is publicly available from, from governmental sources and stuff. So I've used some, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm playing with now is some data about climate change, which is not exactly financial maybe, but it's, it's interesting and topical. And so I've got, from a, a, an international geological service, I've got the average land temperatures in lots of different places, and I'm just choosing a couple of places. So I've got land for 200 years, for 250 years. I've got 250 years of the average land uh, land per month, and that's just from an ordinary agency. You just, I just, all I did to, to get that was do a Google search. I've got other data about CO2 emissions that come from, from an, an, um, another source like that. Governments give lots of financial data about GDP, production, all kinds of data, data are just available in, uh, certainly the UK has a lot and the US has a lot. I've uh, not looked at Singapore data, but I suspect that Singapore has a lot that's openly available. This data is openly available. It tends to be in one of two formats. Uh, one, one of them is called JSON, and the other one's called, called um, uh, comma, comma, uh, CSV, comma separated values. If you get the CSV, you can get either of them and read them into, into Python. There's, there, there's mostly things are in CSV now. CSV is very, very simple data format. It's just, comma, it's just really values and commas. If you, if you take a CSV file and put it in, in, in a, in, in, a, in access, it looks like a, like a spreadsheet, but it's not a spreadsheet. It just, it just it, it, that's what words, what Microsoft does with it. But it, we, what we do with it is we turn it into what's called a data frame, which is a lot like a spreadsheet as it happens, but it's a Python idea. But that, yeah, that's all over the place. That, that data is easy to come by. And uh, the financial prices, the share prices and, and cryptocurrency prices are all right there on Yahoo Finance. No, no problem at all, it's just up to the minute. I believe that answers the questions. Um, and there's another, there's actually quite a few questions afterwards as well. So there's another question um, where they were asking about the formula. So can the formula be put in Excel or must it be used in Jupyter or Python software? Well, you probably could do some of this in Excel. Um, I, I sneakily use Excel quite a lot for testing things out without bothering to program in, the, in, in, in an environment. Um, so lots of formulae you can use, but, it, but, but when you want to keep track of all the data, it's probably easier to use Python and, and, and the data frame. We definitely in the module would expect you to use Python and Python is the main language for the whole the whole program so we we uh, there is a python introductory module which we suggest people do early but just but just in case um, we also put provide 
but free, freely we will provide a sort of boot camp of Python for people who haven't done any Python before to do before they start the program. And if you do that before they start the program, you'll have enough, certainly for my modules. I, the way I do my Python in my modules is I assume that you can do very basic Python programming, but I don't assume you know much. So I then have tutorials for everything you need that, that, are, that come into my module. Most people can skip them because uh, you, you because they already know that stuff. So for example, my in the one I'm writing now, there's a big tutorial about what a data frame is. Most students will know what a data frame is before they come to this module. So they won't need to do that, but I put it there just in case, because I want to, the, the module to be entirely self-contained. In the, in the blockchain module, there, uh, I put in quite a lot about how object orientation works because Thought some students didn't know it that, and I wanted them to use object orientation to, 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 to do the programming. So I make, so we kind of assume a bit, bit of rudimentary uh, programming and a little bit about Python syntax. And so I assume you know what a loop is, for example, but I don't assume you know much else. So we, we try to make it self-contained within the modules as, as much as we can, but having feeling that you you're happy with python before you start most of the modules makes your life a bit easier um and as i say the mo mo almost all the modules are python based the only exception i think now is there's a, an r module that actually teaches r so that obviously isn't, isn't in python at all but right. everything else is in python i think we, we, yeah so another question is actually um, touching on Jupyter. So um, Timothy asked if you will be showing how Jupyter can run live data and send out alerts. Um, apart from Jupyter, what are the other languages um, required? Yeah. Well, Jupyter isn't really a language. It's a, it's a sort of an environment. Um, the language is Python that we use. Most people, I actually not, not, not by, by, by natural inclination a Jupyter person myself, um, I, I've, I've learned to love Jupyter for presenting things. I, when I do programming though, I do it in, in, in an IDE called PyCharm. And I've now learned how to embed um, the, the, uh, the Jupyter into PyCharm. Uh, we don't do, I don't do anything with using real-time data at, at I use, um, I don't think, I don't know if anybody does, but we use it, I mean, I, we use real data, but but we downloaded maybe moments ago rather than coming in. We, we don't, I don't, I don't, and I don't know, maybe some modules do actually, but I don't use data as coming, as uh, uh, processing data as it comes in. That's a good idea. I might bring, that's, that's a really good idea. I might put that into a late topic. Because that is an, that would be an interesting thing to have. Because if you were if you were operating a trading floor, obviously you would want you would want that functionality. So thanks for that, whoever asked that question. I think I will put that in the, in, in a late topic. Yes, thank you so much to Timothy. And we also have two more questions. Uh, the first question is, what's the advantage of the AR over the long short-term memory network for building a prediction model forecasting the stock price? Right, okay, well, this is the way the module works, right? Okay, the module works by, I don't know the answer to that question, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking, on the one hand, a lot of data, on the other hand, a lot of techniques. I'm exploring what works under what circumstances. That's, that's, that's what we're, and, we're, and you're gonna do that with me if you do the module. So we're gonna have a lot of data by the end of, of what seems to work and what, and what, and what, um, in, what, in what kind of data works with what kind of, of techniques. That's what we're trying to find out. So I think of this as this module as a sort of adventure because I, I don't know the answer to that question. So we will find out. And then once we once we know what kind of data works with what kind of techniques, we can then try to sort of back back engineer an explanation and say, all right, well now 
I see you. And, and that, that, that will, in that way, help us understand both the data and the techniques. So I'm, that's the whole point of the module, really, to find this stuff out. I, I'm, 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 learning, I'm learning along with you in that sense. I mean, I know the techniques. I've learned the techniques already, and I have, the, I have some data, and I'll probably keep adding to my data store. But um, we'll, 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 we, will, we, are find, we are finding that out. The AR tends to be pretty good. One of the things that happens, if you look at these subjects, the, 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 a lot of people use something called ARMA or ARIMA, even more, it's a bit, a bit more sophisticated. And I've actually offered a, a, a $100 reward on, on, on Reddit to anybody who could actually find a, 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 a real world example where ARMA works better than AR because it's supposed to, all the books say it does, I can't find data that it works better on. So um, nobody, yet, nobody yet has cho chosen, chosen this $100 reward. Well, we'll see. Maybe one of you guys will do it. So there's $100, the $100 rewards are definitely there for anybody who does it in the program as well as anybody who does it on Reddit. So yeah, I, I would like to see why, um, uh, why everybody so why people in the kind of metrics are so excited by armor. AR works pretty well, actually. Um, so yeah, and you know we we we're going on to much more sophisticated things. And one of the things we go on to is if you take uh, a if you take a standard stock price, and if you look at uh, well. Let's take something else. Let's look at the um, the what are the land, the the land temperature data. What it, the land temperature data tends to look like is it's got two it's got two sort of things. One is it's going up because of global warming, but of course it's seasonal, right? Because uh, you even though it's going up, you don't expect one year's uh, summer to, to be. To be uh, cold, to be colder than 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 a winter in another year. So, we try to take that data and and decompose it to try to get rid of to deal with the seasonality in one way and the trendingness in another way. So we want to think of it as something that's essentially going up. Without it. so we do what's called seasonal adjustment. Probably most of you have heard the phrase seasonal adjustment. So you learn how to seasonally adjust data, but then you also don't want to lose that seasonality. So you want to explore the seasonality and you want to explore the seasonal adjusted um, data. So the, we use different techniques that work with the seasonality and different ones that work with the trending and we put it all together in the end. So that's, that's, that's kind of where we're going. Right. I hope that answers your question, Cindy. And the last question before we progress on with the um, program briefing is, is the key looking at armor models, will it, I'm um, sorry, will it delve into ARC or GARC or is this yes. more machine learning it, about perception? No, 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 we have, we have arch, and, arch and GARCH, there is a topic on ARCH and GARCH. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, I think there's one more um, follow-up question from Cindy. Then what proportion is the most appropriate to split the Y finance data set into train, validation, and test when forecasting the stock price? Will the root mean square error or mean absolute percentage error metrics used to evaluate? You have, you, you, I, I, I have a whole series of lectures on root, why root mean square error is, is the right way to go. And um, I will prove it to you. Not here. We don't have time, but it's it's it is it is the maximum likelihood estimator for constant variance. So it's the only thing really that makes sense to do now. And there's actually empirical reasons why it's better than anything else. So root mean squared error is definitely the way to go. The answer to that question. And the well, I forgot, oh, I there's the 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 standard seventy thirty split of of. The um, training and test, I guess, is where we go when we've got training. Uh, yeah, is that, I think that was your question. I believe so. I believe that's what he may be asking. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to type in your questions later on after the program briefing we will address to them. So now I'll hand over back to Professor Zimmer for the program briefing. Now you can share your slides again. Thank you okay. so much. So we're, we're, we're changing tact here. We're talking about the program instead of the uh, about the, the the module. Okay, so right. Okay, so right. Here we go. There we go. 
Uh, can you see that now? Yes, it looks great. Great, okay. And so this is exactly right. It's a science and computing day. Um, it's MSC data science we're talking about. Okay, so, right. So the way that I, I began to talk about Goldsmiths before, the way that this runs is the University of London is a, a federation of colleges, um, some of which are kind of have more, more international profile than others, like the London School of Economics may well have the highest profile, but UCL is one that's also in Kings and, and several others. It's, I don't I think, I think there's about a dozen, I think. No, I could be wrong. Um, but we're one of them. And we're and Goldsmiths is is interesting because we are we were, we've been running the computing programs for the University of London for over 20 years, certainly well over 20 years, I'm pretty, I, I think over 25 years. Uh, but we're not primarily a computing institution. Uh, we're in, it's an institution we're well known for arts really. So, and that is, affects the way we think to some extent. And we, we have the Goldsmiths Computer Science Department has a lot of people who, who are creative and, and are, are artistic and, and they have music backgrounds and music uh, and arts backgrounds and arts practices. And one of the things that means is they really think about artificial intelligence in a different way. So there's a lot of work in the department about artificial intelligence and machine learning around creativity. So the, pro, the, mod, the department has a lot to do with, pro, with, with creativity and that affects really the way we do virtual reality, which doesn't come into this module, this program, and artificial intelligence, which absolutely does. So that's, and Goldsmith does this with the University of London who've been running distance learning programs for since the 1850s. So they're the oldest provider, I think. This program was launched in April, 2020. We haven't yet launched every single module. We're going to have the first run of every module by next October. Uh, and the idea of the the idea of the program is it it, it it we I want to equip you with skills and understanding both. So you'll learn how to do the things I'm just talking about. You'll learn how to use all these models and stuff, but you won't just learn how to use these models. You'll understand. You'll learn how to produce these models. You'll learn how to produce the next models. You'll learn how to understand the models that come tomorrow because it's not about just teaching you the skills to use the techniques that are there. It's the understanding of what makes them work that is useful to understanding beyond those, the, the present day. So, we, so that's really important. That's why when I was talking about the difference between the way I teach this stuff and an econometrician would teach this stuff, it's really important to me that I teach you how these algorithms work. I teach, so you actually, with some help, we'll do we'll program these algorithms rather than you just use library functions. Because if you just use library functions, all you do is learn how to use library functions, and then you you don't learn what's really going on. So that's so that's what, what we're trying to do. Uh, so one of the things is surprisingly for an online program, we change things pretty constantly. I I very. I see to see this as a living program. This is a subject that's changing all the time. It's we I this change our programs change from what's changing in industry, but it's um it's also changes from what people students tell us. I talk to students all the time about what they need and, and what's going well and what doesn't. We keep adapting the programs to make them work. Uh, it's a data science is a fast changing area. We need to change with it. Uh, so again, this idea about theories as well as skills. You learn theory, you learn how things work. You don't learn just skills. Uh, and we, we, we do, don't worry too much about just all the, the analytics that go out of the gate. We learn, we learn principles as well, or, as, or, or in, in preference in a way. Uh, so we actually are, are in touch with a lot of employers. And in fact, a lot of students on this program, there are now about 700 students on this program in the world. 
And many of them are actually employed in relevant industries. So they work with us on telling us what, 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 what they think is, is needed in these programs, as well as our own research links with, with companies and just teaching links with companies. I have a meeting tomorrow, as it happens, with DeepMind about, about how, how the future of education in this space. Uh, and I have meetings every, every week or two with, with, with IBM and some with Google. We talk to people about what really needs, what students need to know and how the best to teach it. Because one of the great things about, about being data scientists is we gather, we gather the data about the way people interact with these systems as a way of, of improving this, the, the teaching as we go. So we use the data, the data of our own students, um, how they're doing and how they're interacting, especially that's more true with the BSc program I talked about, but because that's on Coursera, we have a lot of data. We have 5,000 students on that program. So we have a lot of data, anonymized of course, about how people, what parts of the program people seem to be um, engaging with and what they seem to be struggling with. And we get ideas about how to improve programs by looking at that. Because data science is everywhere as well in, in, in our teaching as well as in what we teach. Okay. So and we learn to create models to predict future trends. We've just been talking about that. So it's not just descriptive. You're going to be developing your own models, models. You're going to be developing models with your own data, real world data. Uh, whoops. Whoops. Okay, so there's, there's three ways. There's kind of a two by two matrix here. So there's sort of nine things going on, but you can either go do a PG certificate, a PG diploma, or a master's degree, and they're in different, different lengths of time. And you can do them in straight data science or data science with financial technologies. And that's the kind of thing I've been talking about today or data science with a specialism in, in artificial intelligence. So the, so the PG cert is the smallest of the two, the three, and then, and then the, the diploma and then the masters. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Uh, you can study at SIM and I suggest you do. The results at SIM are terrific. Uh, and it's, I think the teach that every, every all the teachers I've met have been fantastic. You can complete the masters, the masters in in two two plus years. So it takes two years if you do it as quickly as you can at at, at, at SIM, and um, that's probably as quickly as it should be done. Each module is studied over twenty two weeks. Uh, you, if you study at SIM, that puts you in a big big advantage over most of the students. Most of the students only have access through the web. And they don't have access to face-to-face -to -face people. They don't, they don't get in a room with other students and they don't get to, to meet a teacher. So being at SIM, you get a real advantage of, uh, over most students that way. And it shows in the results. Okay, there's two ways of joining the program. You have to have an undergraduate degree or, or, or an acceptable equivalent in either case. If you have a sort of computing one or a maths one or an economics one, you're fine. If you have uh, one that's in a, in a uh, degree subject that is quite far from there, and we have quite a few of the students doing that, then you, you, can do the, you can still join the program, but what you have to do first, and, and what well, you get to do first, let's put it that way, is you get to do a MOOC, which, which stands for uh, it's just a, a, an online teaching on Coursera. I don't know if many of you know what Coursera is, but Coursera is a platform that, which is has uh, it's the biggest uh, provider of, of teaching in the world. Really, I think they've got about thirty million users. Um, so you learn there. You learn about the foundations of data science, and we do that by getting talking you through. We're working you through, and you do some work to do it, uh, a particular important algorithm in, 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 uh, in data science called k-means clustering. Clustering is when you take data and put it into sort of compartments and say, these ones are related, 
these ones are related, these ones are related. So you, I'm trying to imagine, I've tried to draw a picture, but I can't. But you can, you can imagine having data and just having sort of uh, uh, boundaries around different bits of it to say these ones are one, one country, these are another country, these are another country. That's a clustering and that's a really important data science uh, thing to do and k-means is, is, is a particular algorithm for that and we talk you through in that we talk you through that algorithm and so you get the idea of how to do an algorithm as I said that before that's really important to how we teach for actually getting you to do the algorithms and again you learn some Python okay so this is the the modules I'll just talk a little bit about some of them uh, the core modules are Statistics and statistical data, data mining. So that teaches you some statistics, obviously, but it also teaches you the techniques of how to uh, get, get useful information from just from random data, from, from data that might look messy. So how you mine data that's useful to you from the data, uh, the data set, you use statistical techniques for that. We do some stuff about cleaning and things like that. Machine learning, you use, learn many of the, the standard techniques in machine learning. Uh, big data programming is in Python. That's the introduction to Python, but it's very it's focused on, on data, data applications. Uh, big data analysis is among, among the, the big tools. You learn how to use the tools that, and, and uh, that pe that that people use in industry, like Hadoop and what and how to use how to use big data, how to use the tools, but how to think about big data and how to use contemporary tools to um, deal with it. Data science research topics is uh, what it sounds like, but it helps you get ready to do your your project. Data visualization is how you visualize data, how you take data and put it in a way that people can gather information from it instead of you. Because visualizing the data is an important part of any data project, even if it's just for yourself. Data visualization is for communicating data, but it's also for convincing yourself what data you've got. Financial markets is a, is a, is a module about financial, a standard module uh, in, in how uh, it goes, it's, for those of you who know what this, 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 this means, it's, it's a black shoal sort of stuff. It's working towards derivatives and how markets um, work in, in evaluating derivatives and, and, other, and, and things like that. Blockchain programming, we talked about neural networks is really misnamed. It should be called deep learning now. It's evolved into a deep learning module. Natural language processing is a great module that's that a lot of it's statistical and natural language processing. So it's how you actually get real information, real information out of people's just the way people speak, for example. Artificial intelligence is, is a module where two things, there's the first half of it is a standard artificial intelligence module using the 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 Russell and Novik book, for those of you who know what that is, it's the standard text that you learn in every any place you do in artificial intelligence at this level. But the second half of the module is three case studies where you where uh, people take you through some very very interesting artificial intelligence questions. One's about how to make a, a robot that actually that can do medical medical predictions or medical diagnosis. How you you make creatures in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of artificial world is another one. Social networks and graph analysis is about how you get, what social networks are about, how you get data from social networks. Now you analyze the whole networks. It's really about network theory. R is uh, how you use R for data analysis. Financial data modeling is actually the module I've just been talking about. And then we're bringing in a, um, a new module on mathematics uh, that's about it's about linear algebra mostly, or linear algebra and, differenti and differentiation, and really how they come together. So differentiating matrices, for those of you who know what that means, that's really important for a lot of algorithms in, to understand the mathematics of a lot of algorithms in data science. Okay, and so there, there's two specialisms. You can do an artificial intelligence specialism, or you can do a financial technology specialism. 
the artificial intelligent ones are the, the you would do all the machine learning in artificial intelligence modules. Financial technology, you do the applications in finance and the sort of things I've talked about. Um, right. So just just so what's new here is that in the compulsory not modules, you've now got uh, the blockchain and the financial markets. So that's all that's different from there in the and the um, the just data science. Here you've got what's compulsory is you've got the uh, neural networks and the research topics. So it's just a little bit different than what's compulsory, but it's the same modules we've already seen. So each module is worth 15 credits, except for the project, which is 30. So we might be trying to bring in a 60 credit module on a project. So, but the way that they work is that they're, um, all of them are in 10 topics. Each topic is therefore about two weeks work. Uh, and a topic supposed to run up to about 15 hours. Uh, so it's about 150 hours per, per module. Uh, and you need to do, in, in the end, you need to do 180 credits. So you can work out, being, being massy sorts of people, you can work out how many 15 credit modules you need for 180 credits. Um, yeah, I think it's 12. But uh, um, so, yeah. And so it's all like that. And within within what happens in a ten credit in a in a in a topic, is you'll see there's a lot of video content, but also under each video you'll get um, quizzes and also readings to do. Sometimes programming activities. My modules tend to have a lot of activities to do as you go through. Lots of so. You get sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they're math activities, sometimes they're programming activities, sometimes, and a lot of the modules have quite a lot of reading. Mine probably has less reading and more, more activity than most. Uh, but that's it. So you, you, you talk through it. And what's really fantastic about these programs is that the students are, are very active in becoming a community. And there's a Slack channels for each of the modules and people, people do interact on the Slack channels and help each other. So as I said before, we, we kind of assuming a bit of Python. So we're giving you that Python as, an, as a free bootcamp if you want it. Um, and it's, 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 be avail it's available someplace on the VLE and we'll tell you where it is. And um, I don't know if we've actually got the maths up and running. We hadn't the last time I looked, but it did, should also be maths. But Python is what's really important. And so that's there available for you because we, we, we want you to succeed. We want to help you prepare to make sure you succeed. Okay, and there's just the, the links to the further information. Okay, gang. So I think that's all I've got to say. Oh, no, it's not all I've got to say. Money. So. If you study at SIM, and I, I suggest you do, this is what the money looks like. You, have, you separately pay University of London uh, and, and, UOL, and, um, and SIM. So you pay, th th these are the fees for the three different, so I don't know if I, I, I talked about the diploma and, and the certificate. The certificates, essentially a, a, a third of a degree, 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 the postgraduate diploma, about two thirds, and the MSc is the whole thing. And that's sort of the way it works. It's I think four, eight, twelve, essentially in terms of module numbers. Uh, and um, yeah, so this this is I, I assume these slides will be available to you somewhere. So rather than go through this many anymore. And that's that's it. That's so that's that's that all I've got to say. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks, guys. I think we've probably come to the end. Yes. Yeah. I Okay, thank, thank, thanks, thanks for listening. And I hope to see lots of you in webinars in the future when, as students. Hopefully. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing the whole session, the masterclass and the program briefing as well. And also for the audience for being very participative and interactive. And I hope you all learned from here. And yeah, thank you so much for joining. And we'll be uploading all the recording um, a week after. So do tune into our YouTube channel. 
And if you have any other questions regarding the program itself, please feel free to write in to us via email or call us at our inquiry hotline. Thank you. And I wish you all have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. I'll end the session now, everyone. Thank you so much.